questions? No? Questions, questions, come on. Too shy. Too smart? Too scared? All right. Okay, so where are we at? We, a couple lectures ago, we talked a lot about convolution, criteria for convolution existence. And then last lecture, we defined what we meant by a discrete time, linear time invariant system. And the more I look at this chapter, the more I see it really needs a heavy rewrite. So I'm hoping to finish that up in the next few days. It won't change any of the facts or anything. It'll just change the look and a couple of definitions. But anyway, discrete time LTI system, definition, well, systems. Such a thing consists of two pieces, this set of input functions. and a system mapping from that set into the set of all discrete time signals. And these things have to have certain properties. The set of input functions has to be closed undertaking linear combinations. It has to be a subspace of f to the z. It has to be closed under time shifting. Every time you shift an input, you should get another one. And it also has to contain at least all the finite duration signals has to be rich enough to be of interest. The system mapping S has to be linear. That's the L in LTI. And it has to be shift invariant. That's the TI in the time invariant. So if you take S operating on a linear combo of inputs, you get the same linear combo of the individual outputs. If you take S operating on a shifted input, you get a shifted version, same shift of the output you would have gotten had you operated on the unshifted input. So that's the definition of a discrete time LTI system. And we saw some examples that we will revisit as we go along. Like the zero system, identity system, pure K1 shift, etc. And we also define this notion of impulse response. So for such a system, H equals S of delta. Delta is always going to be an allowable input because the input function space always contains all the finite duration signals, of which delta is a paradigmatic example. And that's the system's impulse response. And at the very end of class last time, we showed this key fact here. And that is that for every finite duration input, at least those in X, so every finite duration input signal x, s of x is the convolution of the impulse response with that input. And that's pretty much where we are. So for any discrete time LTI system, the impulse response tells you the whole story about how the system operates, at least on finite duration inputs. Okay. Back in 2200, we had sort of a more universal kind of view of impulse response and its relationship to the system mapping. Namely that for every input, that was true, that s of x is equal to h involved with x. And we're going to invoke that as a standing assumption because it's only for sort of carefully invented, badly behaved systems that that doesn't hold. Okay, so it turns out, and you can look in the monograph for an example of one for which it doesn't hold, for reasonably well-behaved systems, S of x is going to equal h convolved with x for all x's. 
in the input function space x, not just finite duration x. And see the monograph, for example, of one that's not reasonably well behaved in this sense. So the monograph, I could go over it in class, but I choose not to. Essentially, what's going on in such systems is they're not continuous at infinity, so to speak. And I don't even want to go there during lecture. But we are going to introduce the standing assumption that for all the discrete time systems we're talking about, the impulse response tells the entire story of the input-output mapping S. So our standing assumption is that all the systems we deal with satisfy S of x equals h convolved with x for every x in the input function space x. And a consequence of that standing assumption is that if someone comes up to you on the street and says, here's an H, and this is the impulse response of an LTI system, what is the response of this other signal, of the system to this other signal, this other input? You would be able to figure that out just knowing H. You wouldn't need any of this mumbo jumbo abstract, X, S, all that kind of stuff. Now, a fir oh, satisfy is misspelled. Okay, I hope you caught that on the film. All systems satisfy that. Furthermore, we're going to assume that the input function space for such a system is as big as it can possibly be in the following sense. What does it mean to be as big as it can be? It means that it has to contain all the signals that are convolvable with H. So X has to be the set of all X in F to the Z for which H convolved with X exists. And notation I'm going to use for that if I'm given H script D sub H is going to be that set. So it's a set of all X in F to Z such that H could evolve with X exists. Okay, now we have to be careful here because input function spaces for LTI systems have to have these two properties, or three properties. First off, they have to be subspaces. Second of all, they have to be shift invariant. And third of all, they have to contain all the finite duration signals. Does D sub H have those three properties for an arbitrary H? So, wait. We must check that given H, D sub H satisfies all the properties or has all the properties, satisfies all the requirements on an input function space. Okay, so let's go through those requirements and make sure we believe that D sub H satisfies them. So first off, D sub H is a subspace. Subspace, not just a subset, 
of f to the z. Why is that the case? Because if x1 and x2 are in d sub h, and c1 and c2 are scalars in f, whatever f happens to be, H involved with C1 X1 plus C2 X2. Because of the nature of convolution, being an integral, and because of the bilinearity thereof, C1 H convolved with X1 is one term, plus C2 H convolved with X2 is the other term. And these both exist. And so this does. You could start with H convolved with X1 and H convolved with X2, combine them with C1 and C2, merge the two integrals, nothing bad is going to happen, and you get the integral defining H convolved with this one. Okay? Upshot, D sub H is closed under linear combos, therefore it's a subspace. Okay, is it closed under shifting? Let's make sure we believe that. How do we check to see whether something is closed under shifting? We say, okay, suppose I have an x that's in there. So if I'm given an x in d sub h, and some time shift, k0, in the integers, let's try to compute h convolved with shift k0 of x and see whether that exists. What's the definition? It's the integral from minus infinity to infinity h, or sorry, sum. We haven't gotten to continuous time yet, folks. Sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, h of k, shift k0 of x at n minus k, and that's true for all n. And having that convolution exists means that this infinite sum converges for every n. Let's make sure it does. Rewrite it as k equals minus infinity to infinity, h of k. Shift k0 of x evaluated at n minus k is x of n minus k0 minus k. And that's still true for all n. Now let's do a little change of variable in the summation. Let's let m equal n minus k0. And that means that, or no, uh, wait, n equals n minus k. Or, oh, let me, let me, I want to do it right the first time. So let's take a deep breath. Let me do this over here. That's right. So let's m equal k plus k0, which means that k is equal to m minus k0, 
And <clears throat> when m runs from minus infinity to infinity, k runs from minus infinity to infinity, so does m. And what does that change? Oh, this is terrible. I'm messing this up terribly. I feel like having you turn the camera off, but I'm not going to. The world will see this. <laughs> Let's just, I'm going to do it a tricky way. <clears throat> Put these two in brackets inside there, okay? I know that the sum of h of k, x of anything minus k over all k exists. And that's just going to be h convolved with x at whatever that thing is. So this is the same as h convolved with x evaluated at n minus k0 for all n, which is the same as shift k0 of h convolved with x evaluated at time n. So that's the same as shift k0 of h convolved with x evaluated at time n for all n. And the conclusion is that if I take h and I convolve it with shift k0 of x, I get shift k0 of h convolved with x. And the fact that h convolved with x exists, which is a given because x is in d sub h, means that its shift by k0 is, exists, obviously. And we've just shown that that shift by k0 ends up being the same calculation as we would have to perform to compute h convolved with shift k0 of x. And there's a missing of n up there. So I'm going to flip the boards for a second, put that up there. So this is all correct. All right. So that's that's right. So d sub h is a subspace. d sub h is closed under shifting. And finally, does it contain all the finite duration signals? So finally, d sub h contains all the finite duration signals. And we don't even have to write an equation out for this, because why? What is d sub h? It's the set of all x convolvable with h. Why does that set contain all the finite duration signals? Well, h isn't necessarily finite duration. His proposal was because the convolution of any two finite duration signals always exists. We have something even more powerful than that at our disposal. <coughs> Ricardo. Uh, finite duration signal can be represented as a sum of number functions and can always involve all the functions. Well, I want an even shorter answer than that, based on our previous discussion, our, our convolution discussion. Okay. Let's let's think back to our criteria for convolution existence. What was the very first one? Brian. Yeah, if either signal has finite duration, then their convolution is well defined. Therefore, okay. Well, 
Okay, when you're in the context of a system, okay, with impulse response H, we assume that X is equal to DH, where DH is the set of all little X's convolvable with H. Okay, that's the point. Well, DH depends on H, but X doesn't until you tell me what the system is. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I understand your question correctly. <laughs> but see, you had this good thing going. You had a very good sentence going. Um, you, were saying, you were saying that by criterion one for a convolution, yeah, it contains all the finite duration signals because because criterion one, or by criterion one. Namely, finite duration signals are convolvable with anything. That's a mantra, okay? And you had internalized that, or at least flipped back to read it off the page or something, I don't know. You, you had externalized it. Yeah. yeah. Everybody get that? I feel like, yeah, I feel like I'm not. Erica. So then which one is the finite duration? So X. See, see, we want to make sure, we, we want to make sure that for any H, any H at all, if someone comes up to you on the street, forget about the previous board, someone comes up to you on the street and gives you this discrete time signal H and says, here, okay, tell me what, D sub H is. What are all the signals convolvable with H? And you say, well, it's a, it's a big set, but I know the following about it. It's a subspace, okay? It's closed under shifting, and it contains all the finite duration signals by criterion one. Okay, got it? Okay. All right, so, so the bottom line is we want to Think of all of our systems, all the systems we're going to deal with are going to be ones that are sufficiently well behaved so that their impulse response H tells the whole story about the system. And that's the most important observation to take away from here. If you know the impulse response of a system satisfying our standing assumptions, you know the system. So the big takeaway is takeaway hyphenated or one word or two words? No hyphen? But that looks like take key away, take key away. Whatever. The big takeaway is for a system satisfying the standing assumptions. Some shun. If you know H, you know the system. Why? Given H, the input function space X is D sub H, so you know X, and the system mapping S is equal to H convolve with X for all X in capital X, which we've assumed by the standing assumption is D sub H. So you can figure out the input function space, and you can figure out the system mapping just knowing H for system satisfy satisfying our standing assumptions. So in a sense, as we talk about these discrete time systems, we can just talk about impulse responses, or we can talk about systems, whatever we want, and it doesn't matter. And an upshot of this is that <clears throat> every interesting system property is going to have a characterization in terms of a property of the impulse response. And we'll see a couple of those later on today. All right, so first off, let's, let's, I want to look at our example systems and, may, and figure out the impulse responses. They're pretty easy, as you might imagine. So let's compute the impulse responses and by the way, all of our example systems satisfy the standing assumption.
So let's just go through them one by one. And here's a picture. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture I want you to keep in mind as we talk about systems here. If you think of this, this is one that you've seen, those of you who took 2200 last spring. If you have the system and you put a delta into the system, what comes out? H. It's S of delta. Or you can think of the system as something that has H coded in. And when you put in an X, any X, in X what comes out is S of X equals H convolved with X. So you can think of H either as being the output of the system corresponding to a specific input, namely delta, or as what you convolve with arbitrary allowable inputs to give you the output. For all of our example systems, we're going to figure out the impulse response using this. Namely, just plug in delta and see what comes out. So let's do that for our example system. First off, what about the, the zero system? What is H? Yeah, the zero signal, right? So H equals S of delta equals zero, because S of anything for the zero si signal system is the zero signal. And how about the identity system? What's H equal to? Say it loud. Delta, delta right. Why? H equals S of delta. And the identity system takes any input and gives you the input as the output. And in the case the input is the delta, the output is the delta. OK, those are easy. How about the pure K1 shift? What is the impulse response? Using our, use our notation to, <laughs> I know, if shift sub k1 of, shift, shift k1 operates on signals, right? So h equals s of delta. What does s do to signals? It shift k1s them, or shifts k1 them. What is the right way of saying that? Shift K1 of delta. It's like passerby's is not right, but passersby is right. I know that's what Nathan was trying to say, right? Yeah, I was saying. You're saying it differently, fine. Okay. If you don't like the notation, it's not a problem. You know, we don't have to agree on everything. Okay, so one thing here is now we know how to shift a signal. We just convolve it with a shift to delta. Right? It's another way of looking at it. Ooh, now, what about the finite, the, the causal sliding window unfold averager? Let's figure out what the impulse response for that is. So the m-fold averager, let me, let me remind you of the definition of this. The input function space is f to the z. And s of x for any x in that input function space has specification s of x at time n equals 1 over cap m sum from k equals 0 to cap m minus 1 of 
x of n minus k for all n. Systems output at time n is the average of the capital M previous input values up through and including time n. Okay, what's the impulse response? The impulse response is S of delta. So thus, H being S of delta has specification. Whatever we get when we plug delta in for x. So let's plug delta in for x and see. See what pops out of that. What are those big things they're building in Duffield Hall with the pictures on them? What are, what's that? Is it for homecoming weekend, dog and pony show kind of thing? Yeah. Are you guys going to go check out any of that tomorrow? That art squad thing? <laughs> it's such a nice day. It's going to be a nice day. Don't try to blame me. <laughs> okay. No, that we're inaugurating Cornell. Cornell is one of the last schools not ever to have had a female president up to now. So finally we have, we're inaugurating our first female president. And, and have, you, have you met her at all? Anybody? Calm down, everybody. <laughs> okay, H equals S of delta N has this specification. H of N equals 1 over M. The sum, I have to start writing on the board to make people be quiet. Oh, well. Delta of N minus K for all N in the integers. Okay, now th this is an interesting sum in a way. What is that equal to? Well, we have to think about what the delta is, right? Delta is only 1 when its argument is 0, and it's 0 when its argument is anything else. Okay? So the only time you're going to have a non-zero term in this sum so the only ends for which the sum contains a non-zero term are those n values for which n minus k is 0 for some k in this range. So those are the only n values. I'll write it this way for once instead of less than m. And for those n values, exactly one term in the sum is non-zero. So for such n values, the sum contains exactly one non-zero term. The one where k is equal to n. And that term is a 1. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is this paragraph that I've just written tells us exactly what H is. 
h of n is equal to 1 over m, remember we have to remember the 1 over m outside here, when n is in the range for which n minus k equals 0 for some k in the range 0 to k up to there, what does that mean that n lies in this range? So it's equal to 1 over m when 0 is less than or equal to n less than m. I'll write it in the usual way. And it's 0 otherwise. Because those are the n values for which n minus k is 0 for some k in the range 0 to, k, 0 to m minus 1. Everybody see that? That's what the impulse response of a sliding window averager is? All right, so how about the discrete time integrator? For this system, remember that x, we didn't say what it was. We just said it was the set of all things for which the output existed. But the output s of x for any x in x has specification S of x for any n is the sum from, and there's many ways of writing this. Let's write it this way. k equals minus infinity to n of x of k. And I think before when I wrote it, I wrote it sum from k equals 0 to infinity of x of n minus k, which is the same thing. But it turns out it's easier to figure out the impulse response from this formula. That's the discrete time integrator. How do we figure out the impulse response? We use the picture. h equals s of delta. Thus, h equals s of delta has specification. Whatever you get when you plug delta in for x. So h of n equals sum from k equals minus infinity up to n of delta of k for all n. So what's that equal to? What happens when I sum delta of k over all k from minus infinity up to n? What do I get? What do I get if n equals minus 17? Zero. What do I get if n equals minus 3? What do I get if n equals zero? One. What do I get if n equals 10 to the 59? So we detect a pattern here, right? h of n is 0 unless k equals 0 is included in the sum, in which case it's 1. Which means that this is equal to 1 when n is bigger than or equal to 0. Thus, k equals 0 is included in the sum and 0 when n is less than 0. In which case, k equals 0 is excluded from the sum. And there's, we have a name for that, right? What's that called? Yeah, it's u of n for all n. So h of n is u of n for all n, and a signally way of writing that is h equals u, where there are no of n's. So 
So discrete time integrator, its impulse response is a unit step. So those are our example systems. Those are their impulse responses. And all the systems, like I said, satisfy our standing assumption. And now's a good time to take a three-minute break. And after that, we'll talk about some cool system concepts and their embodiment in terms of the impulse response. These wireless headphones. I don't see any plug holes. Okay, I just turned it on, so let's see what I hear. Oh wait, no, it goes over your head. I thought you were supposed to you know like a beard I hear white noise. You could also do it this way. But it So I guess no one's trying to communicate with us. Okay. All right. All right, anyway, uh, so now we know the impulse responses of our example systems. And we can carry on. Remember what I said earlier about system satisfying our standing assumption. Interesting system properties are going to be embodied in properties of the impulse response. That's what we're going to see the rest of today. Before we go on with that, I want to emphasize a point that may seem obvious to everybody, but it's the kind of thing that goes under the radar sometimes. So this is a point worth emphasizing. Systems, what do they do? They process whole signals into whole signals. So the point of that is that if you're given a time n, the output value at time n, in general, is allowed to depend on every single input value over all time. 
Certainly not just on the one at time n. So, so in particular, it's, it's systems don't process numbers into numbers one at a time. In particular, the value of the output s of x corresponding to some input x at time n, namely using our notation s of x at time n, depends in general on all values x of m for all m in the integers. Not just on the value at x at time n, not just in general on the past values, not on a finite number of values in general, sometimes yes, sometimes no, whatever. Okay? Systems process whole signals into whole signals. If you introduce various restrictions on how many values of the input signal x, the output value at time n, can depend on, that's when you get these quote unquote interesting properties of systems, at least the first two that we're going to talk about. So here's some cases where the IO quote unquote dependence has restrictions. Okay, and actually there's only two, so I'm not going to say some, because some, to me, does some come out more than two to you guys? Yeah. Like when I was a kid, I asked my mother, I, you know, like I, I always heard them talking things like a few, several, that, so I said, what is a few? And she said, it's three. And I said, what is several? And she said, six. <laughs> does that not make sense to you? She jumped instantly to six. And, and, you know, once you get up to 12, it's like a dozen, you know, so. So, two. Let's be, let's be. Two cases where I dependence has restrictions. So, a system is what we call an FIR system. And we learned a lot about those in EC2200. When its impulse response has finite duration. Okay, now what does FIR stand for? FIR stands for quote unquote finite impulse response, but that's kind of a bad name. It should be FDIR. It shouldn't be FIR. Because every impulse response is finite in the value sense. What we're talking about here is a duration. So it's a traditional, but in my opinion, kind of not a great name. That's what an FIR system is. Now, I claim that that's a case where this IO dependence has some restrictions. Why? If you have a finite duration impulse response, for an FIR system, S of x equals h convolved with x has specification
s of x at time n, which is just h convolved with x at time n, equals the sum over all k, k equals minus infinity to infinity of h of k, x of n minus k. But this ostensibly infinite sum is really a finite sum because h has finite duration. Thus, for every n, the value of s of x at time n is only going to depend on a finite number of values of the input. So for each n, s of x at time n depends only on a finite number of input values not on all the values, x of m, for all m in the integers. That's going to be true for an FIR system. But in general, it's still going to depend on more than one. It's not going to just depend on the value at time n or whatever. OK, two questions. What is the input function space for an FIR? F I, sometimes I lapse into a southern accent when I say FIR because my colleague Rick Johnson, who is from Georgia, <laughs> You, 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 you have him for that painting class, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he, he has this way of sermonizing sometimes in his lectures. But every time I say the word FIR, I hear his voice. And I think FIR, FIR. I don't know why. Don't know why. But yeah, he and I arrived at Cornell like one semester apart. Yeah, he came, he came in, in the fall of 81. I came in the January of 82. Yes, the giant statue in his office. And his desk is so completely OCD clean. It's, you know, I, uh, he's not OCD, but his desk is. His desk is symptomatic. Anyway, OK. Um, all right, so it depends only on a finite number of input values. So the question is, what is the input function space capital X for an FR system? Remember, our standing assumption is that we made the impulse function, the impulse, the input function space as big as we can by including everything convolvable with the impulse response. So I ask you again. For an FIR system, what is x? What is d sub h? Alex? It's the so-called signals because it's impulse, impulse response is finite duration. Yes. Because the impulse response has finite duration, you can convolve it with anything. Thus, the set of all things convolvable with it is the set of all signals. So note. For an FIR system, x equals d sub h equals f to the z. And this equality holds because h has finite duration. By criterion 1. It's equal to f to the z. Our example systems. Is the zero system an FIR system? Yes, is the identity system? No? OK, we just figured out the impulse responses for all these systems. All we have to do is go back and look at the impulse responses and see whether they have finite durations, right? Nathan? Yeah. OK. So. Once again, is the identity system, does that have finite, does that have, is that an FIR system? Yes. yes, because its impulse response is delta, the quintessentially finite duration signal. What about the pure K1 shift? Has that, does that have finite, or is that an FIR system? Yes, because the impulse response is a shift to delta. How about the sliding window unfold averager? 
Yes, that's an FIR system because the impulse response only endures for capital M time steps. Well, it endures a zero outside of that, but nonetheless, it's only non-zero in that range. And the discrete time integrator, is that FIR? No, right, because you, the impulse response there has infinite duration. Good, all right, so now we're on the same page with FIR. Causal, the system is causal. when for every n, and I'll, first I'm going to state it in words, and then I'm going to state the mathematical conditions. So for every n in the integers, the value of the output at time n namely s of x at time n depends only on the present and past input values, namely the values of x at times m less than or equal to n. So it depends only on the values of x of m for m less than or equal to n. That is to say, only on present and past values, and not on the future values. So I'll put that phrase in quotes. All right, so that's what it means for a system to be causal. And that's kind of a loosey-goosey, you know, colloquial definition that you might read in a novella or The New Yorker or something like that. We can make that mathematical, though. Okay, so let me, let me give you the precise mathematical definition. And you have to write this down. It's in the monograph. The system is causal when the following is true. Whenever x1 and x2 in capital X satisfy x1 of m equals x2 of m, for all m less than or equal to n, the outputs that arise from these inputs are also equal for all m less than or equal to n. And this holds for every n in the integers. Okay, so what's the wordy way of saying this? When you have two inputs that agree up to time n, the outputs have to agree up to time n. Otherwise, the system would somehow be seeing the future where the inputs disagree. Okay, so let me write that down as a sentence. If two inputs agree up to time n, so do corresponding outputs. That's what causality is all about. All right. So let's reflect on our example systems. Decide whether each of those is or is not causal. Okay. How about the the zero system, is that causal? Yes, because you don't have to 
you don't have to, it's trivially causal. What about the identity system? Yes. What about the pure K1 shift system? Not necessarily. We'll get back to that one. How about the, the causal sliding window m fold averager? <laughs> I built that in, didn't I? OK. How about uh, the discrete time integrator? Yes. Because you, you could just look at the formula for the output at time n. It's explicitly a sum of all the previous input values. It involves no future. It has no future. That sounds negative. So, so of the example systems, all are causal except, except one. And that one left over one is the pure K1 shift. And what is the condition on K1 that makes that system non-causal. Like, it is causal when K1 equals 0. When K1 equals 0, the pure K1 shift is just the identity system. So that's causal. So there's some values of K1 for which the pure K1 shift is causal and some for which it's not. And which are the ones for which it's not? Manish. K1 is less than 0. Because remember, I, I know that there's, there's always a little bit of confusion about, do we, when he said shift K0, did he mean x of n minus K0, or x of n plus K0? But it's actually x of n minus K1 for this. So if K1 is less than 0, then s of x at time n is equal to x of n plus something positive, something later. So that makes that system non-causal. All right. Anyway, the, the FIR system and the causal, FIR systems and causal systems are systems where there are some restrictions on this sort of input-output dependence. In one case, you depend only on a finite number of inputs. In another case, you depend only on past inputs. But for general systems, you could depend on the whole range of input values over all time. Okay. Now, every interesting system property has a characterization in terms of a property of the impulse response. For an FIR system, it's just that the impulse response has finite duration. What about for a causal system? What is the characterization of causality in terms of the impulse response? Here's the fact. A system with impulse response H is causal if and only if H of n is equal to 0 for n less than 0. That is the criterion for causality in terms of an impulse response. And it's really easy to show. And I want to talk about this because it, it sort of reminds us of what the impulse response actually is. And also, it reminds us of what causality is all about. Causality is all about the, the system can't respond to anything that hasn't happened yet. That's what causality is about. And British people, by the way, call it non-anticipativeness. Okay, that's, yeah, a system is non-anticipative. If it doesn't respond to the future, it doesn't anticipate. Okay, so that's what causality is all about. Nothing can happen at the output until something has happened at the input, right? Fair enough? Okay. So, suppose a system is causal. Why must its impulse response be zero for negative time?
Ricardo? I mean, you can see by writing out the um, convolution. <laughs> don't, don't. Too mathematical. <laughs> Nothing can happen at the output until something happens to Erica. Well, we're not, okay, you're, you're on the right track here. Yes? Nothing happens before time zero. What's your name again? Did I ask you already? Okay, James, 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 James. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, so now I'll definitely only call you Juice Young. <laughs> right? Okay, well, if you want to be called, rather be called James than Juice Young, I can call you that. I like it almost as much as I like existence, but, <laughs> but yeah, he, James got it right. Okay, here's, here's, the system is causal. So suppose the system is causal, because nothing happens in the impulse until time zero, nothing can happen at the output until time zero when the input is an impulse. So because h equals s of delta and because, or no, and, and nothing happens in delta until time zero, nothing happens in h until time zero. That is to say, h of n equals zero for n less than zero. And so putting Erica and James's answers together is we got that, okay? And you could do it formally. You can say, well, wait a minute now. Uh, x x1 equals delta and x2 equal to zero signal agree for all time m less than or equal to zero. Therefore, their corresponding outputs have to agree for all times less than or equal to zero. Therefore, h of n has to equal zero because the output to the zero input is the zero signal blah. Okay, so you can do it formally, but I prefer to think of it this way. System sitting on the floor, how do you figure out the impulse response? You walk up to it at time zero and you give it a kick and see what happens, right? If the system is causal and it's sitting on the floor, it doesn't know you're coming, okay? It's not like starting up, you know, to get away or whatever, you know. It's just waiting for you. Until you kick it, nothing comes out of it. Okay, so that's why causal implies h of n equals zero for n less than zero. And now we're going to use your Ricardo method to show that the other direction holds. So suppose conversely that h of n is equal to zero for n less than zero. Then for any x, in the input function space x, which is d sub h, the set of all convolvable with h signals, s of x equals h convolved with x has specification s of x at time n is equal to the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of h of k x of n minus k that's true for all n But because h of n is 0 for n less than 0, h of k is 0 for k less than 0, so this is only a sum from k equals 0 to infinity. That's what changed. And that's still true for all n. And you can, as Ricardo said, you can just see from looking at that sum that the value of the output at time n depends only on x of n, x of n minus 1, x of n minus 2, x of n minus 3, and so on. It depends only on the present and past values of x and not <coughs> on the future values of x. And that's true for all n. So evidently,
we're all in. S of x of n depends only on x of n, x of n minus 1, x of n minus 2, and so on. That is to say, only on present and past. And by the way, you know, folks like who are, who are worrying about the, what, you know, how formal do I have to be when I'm proving these things on homework one, right? And some people came up to me and said, you know, I have this, I have this word, this proof in words, but it's not adequate, I don't think. So I look at it and I say, oh, that's fine. You know, the, the best proofs don't have any equations, right? If you can explain something in words, you don't have to write down a bunch of steps with implication signs and all that. So, you know, proofs are actually not just equations. This is just as good as any proof with equations. So for all n, the present value s of x of n depends only on the present and past values of x, and thus the system is causal because x is arbitrary. All right, so that's causality in terms of the impulse response. Fair enough. Okay, what's the next interesting system property that we're going to, and in fact, it's the last interesting system property we're going to talk about before we move on? It's stability, and specifically bounded input, bounded output stability. And, I, you know, I'm standing here with a minute left, and so I don't think it's a good time to to write anything down about that. So we'll get to that next time.